I'm beginning to feel like a marked man. Because people keep coming up to me, not just from here, but from who I don't even really know, and saying to me, when are you going? <laughs> As if they expect that we're already packing our bags, ready to ship off into the unknown. So I, I really feel like they need to make a big announcement that we're, we're not going until the summer of 19, and we don't know where we'll be going until the autumn. It's a... Uh, an interesting time as we are talking about transition, both for the, the churches here in this circuit, as well as for us as we wonder what's going to happen next. It's one of those times in a way when you would like to be able to see into the future, to borrow a doctor who's TARDIS, just to sort of launch forward and get a sense of, of where we will be and for you to have a sense of who it is that might be standing in the front when the dust has settled after my departure. Times of transition and change. And we enter one of those with our gospel reading. The lectionary doesn't always put things in the order they appear in the story. So we've jumped about a bit and failed, in a sense, to, to recognise the importance of this moment. Before it, Jesus is on the road to Caesarea Philippi and asks the disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter replies, you are the Christ. And that great moment of revelation. And in the way Mark tells his story, part of the genius of this gospel writer is that now, and only now, does he begin to unravel the reality of what's going to happen. Jesus, for the first time, begins to share with his disciples what is to take place. And Mark begins it very simply. Jesus then began, he says, to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. Mark 8 and verse 18. It's verse 38, sorry. It's a really important turning point in the story where the images of suffering, rejection, death and resurrection begin to be played out. It's almost like you're switching from O-level or GCSE if you're younger to A-level teaching and suddenly it becomes quite a bit harder to contend with and deal with because the teachers ramp up what they're expecting you to do. Jesus begins to invite the disciples to think anew. And in a way, he invites them, or he responds to them, with five stages. And I promise you, this isn't five points, seven to me as long as the, you know, each point as long as a three point. They're all quite short as he really shows his leadership here as he invites them to understand what's going to happen next. And we're going to go on this journey this morning. Back with the idea, with that familiar phrase from Paul writing to the Corinthians, how the cross is a stumbling block to the Jews and his foolishness to the Gentiles to see the way in which Jesus invites his followers to go on this remarkable journey. The first thing we can say is it was necessary to teach. When you ask someone, when you find out someone has been a teacher or is a teacher, and you ask that question, what did you teach? you would normally see that look of horror cover their face. It's okay if they were primary school, because they can just say, I taught primary school, and everyone in a sense remembers those days with that, that fuzzy glow of youth, and, and it's great, and primary school teachers, like Jonathan here, are held up in high esteem. When they're secondary school teachers, and you find that out, and you ask that question, and they reveal what their subject is, we react, depending on our experience of school. If they're a physics teacher and we loathe physics, our face will give us away. If they're a maths teacher and we love maths, we will respond perhaps in a different way than if they taught the geography that we particularly despised when we were at school. But we know that when we were younger, we needed to be taught. We needed to be educated because in a way it's brought us to where we are now. It's laid the foundations for our development, enabled us, in a sense, to be effective members of this society. So Jesus 
having got them to the point, the disciples to the point of where they said, you are the Christ, now begins to explore and explain. He invites them to think anew. He lays out his band of followers something of what is going to be. In effect, he is saying to them, this is what it means to be the Messiah. And as we journey through Lent, the question we have to ask ourselves is how we understand that. What it is to be the Messiah. Jesus, in effect, takes them by the hand and reveals something of what is to be. And we have to ask ourselves whether we have journeyed there, whether we've been involved in the discussion. Have we taken in just who Jesus was and what was to be? We need to remind ourselves that we don't know all the answers and that we need to be taught that secondly, we can understand that Jesus' teaching is startling. I'm reading a book by Simon Seabag Montefiore on the history of Jerusalem. And I know that Jerusalem had a fairly turbulent history, but this book, seemingly in every other paragraph, has thousands being slaughtered, Jerusalem laid ruin, and all sorts of hideous and horrible things happening. And sometimes I have to put the book down because in a sense it has surprised me at how many people have been slaughtered by Muslims or Christians or whoever it is in the name of religion and the blood-splattered streets of Jerusalem showing something of that reality. We encounter those things that startle us, that make us stop. And the disciples here, we have to remember hadn't got the whole story. They, like their contemporaries, had been waiting for the Messiah to come. They, like their contemporaries, had an image of what that Messiahship might look like and feel like. And when Jesus says to them, okay, here's how it's going to be. Suffering, rejection, death, hammer blow so that when he says and then resurrection on the third day he will rise again it's almost you can imagine not quite taking that in because what he's saying is so startling because they thought the messiah was going to come with an avenging sword chuck the romans out everything was going to be hunky-dory once more and the jewish state recreated they weren't expecting the triple whammy of suffering rejection and death. And you can almost imagine the ripples of shock going through this group who were listening to what Jesus had to say. It's like they hadn't read their Old Testament. Because if you look into the page of the Old Testament, you see something of what's going to be. In the suffering servant portion of Isaiah, in chapters 40 to 55, there are great images there of who the Messiah is going to be and how it's going to be like that Jesus fulfilled. Go back into the, the, the joys of Leviticus. David Charlton is an expert, will tell you all about Leviticus. This book of laws and regulations is really heavy going. But in there is the idea that those who die on a piece of wood, hang from a gibbet, hang on a cross, are cursed and outside the law. Which is how Jesus, in a sense, overcame the law. Because he removed himself from its influence and was able to defeat it and say, here is something new. There is here a powerful reminder for us that Jesus startled his followers. And as we encounter the reality of this story as we reflect upon the biblical epic we need to remind ourselves that we've got to sense how startling this is and allow ourselves to in a sense to enter into the minds of those who were there and see the way in which this made them think and ponder and respond to the Jesus who was there 
because having been startled, Jesus moves into a third stage where he begins to reveal things that in a sense would be shocking as well. Here are these people and they are told that the people who are going to put Jesus to death involved in that rejection are not the Romans who they despised, not the Herodian kings who were not particularly pleasant in with the Romans and therefore agents of the Romans and therefore not looked upon with any great favour. It wasn't because of some great invading army that was going to come and, and put Jesus to death. It was going to be the leaders of the Jewish people. And for these God-fearing Jews, you have to sense this almost seismic questioning of their understanding of how things were meant to be. There is something here of the, the revolutionary way that Jesus invites his followers to embrace. It is a staggering moment. It's almost as if, you know, you wake up in the morning and the news is that Justin Welby, Vincent Nichols, Kevin Watson and Lorraine Meller are some sort of great mafiosa setup extorting the British people. It is absolutely shocking for what these people are expecting to hear. They are taken by surprise and stunned and I will stop my phone making strange noises. Technology is a wonderful thing. So there is these momentous moments that Jesus says, this is how it's going to be. But fourthly, we need to recognise importantly that here Jesus is kind and wise. The hardest thing I have ever had to do is I received a call from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, which isn't normal everyday thing, when I was wet behind the ears as a minister. And the man on the end, who had some very frightfully posh name and terribly proper accent, informed me that the son of two of my congregation had been murdered in Poland. And could I go and tell them? And he very kindly, I think, explained to me how this murder had happened and painted a picture of the fairly gruesome scene that was there in Warsaw. And you then face that question of not only how do you tell these people, but what do you tell them? And it is one of the things that I look back on and the agonies that I went through in my efforts to get it right. And I'm not convinced I got it right, but I, I did my best. Jesus here has to tell them important things. But what he doesn't do is tell them the full horrors. He paints a picture of what is to be as if preparing them, but he doesn't tell them quite what crucifixion will feel like and be like. They would have had an idea because it was part and parcel of what happened, but he tries to deliver the news in a way that shows his wisdom and kindness. He knows the journey ahead is going to be tough. This Lenten journey is difficult. Good Friday is a horrible, bleak day that we respect with great solemnity. It's not a day to sort of cheer and celebrate. It's a day that shows some of the, the full horrors of what humanity is capable of. But he tries to ease them into the journey and talk of the way in which if you pick up your cross and follow me, that's the thing. He identifies life is going to be tough, but he tries to in a way that's kind so that he can take them with him. This picture, this stumbling block, this foolishness. In, in essence, he's saying, this is what you've been told. This is the story of the Jews. Listen and hear and let's journey into what lies ahead. Because finally... Jesus has made it 
clear what's going to be. Remember back when we were at school and those subjects you didn't understand? I remember sitting through physics and I never got physics. I had two brutes of teaching in the first two years and an insipid one in the third year of doing physics and, and it was just completely up here. Didn't get anything of it. Now, even now, when the children were doing their GCSEs and coming saying, I've got my physics homework, Dad, can you help me? It was like, get behind me, Satan, because this is a terrible thing. Jesus doesn't dress up in fancy language. He doesn't make things complicated. He says, this is the journey. And here, in a way, we see that leadership that Jesus offered. He said, this is where I'm going. Are you willing to follow? This is going to be difficult. Are you willing to pick up your cross? Yes. There will be victory. But it will be a hard journey in the meantime. This way, there will be a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. As Jesus says, no avenging army. No military uprising, but rejection and death to allow victory. And there, in a way, is his great leadership. That he took them on in stages. He invited them to come to their mind as to who he was. And then and only then did he begin to explore what was going to happen next. And Mark's gospel then moves their attention towards Jerusalem and what is going to be. Which Mark does with a, a touch of genius. And here, in a sense, is our great challenge as we think of what the gospel story says as we reflect upon the way in which the epistles try to unravel what is going on, it says to us, you need to listen and learn. At times, you will be startled. Parts of what will be, will be revealed. But most of all, it says, let's follow Jesus. Let's pick up our cross and know that where we journey is where Christ invites us and therefore where he by his spirit will be. Our challenge at Lent is to reconnect with this story and let it speak. Not to think that we all know it all, but to allow its fullness to touch us anew. So we see the Christ who led and invited others to follow. See how he did it with love and with wisdom and how in love he says to us, come. Invites into the journey that lies ahead. Invites us to trust him to pick up our cross and to know, to believe that in the end Christ will gain the victory. Amen.